it's Jan from Jan Does Reviews, and today we're going to do another um, reading beauty, and my book selection for today is a book I just finished. It's The Woman in the Moonlight. Um, it's by Pat Patricia Morris Rowe. Um, it's 300, excuse me, 367 pages long. Um, it's a romantic love story featuring around Beethoven's um, Moonlight Sonata, and it's very loosely based on historical fact. It's a fictional book, of course, but um, the Moonlight Sonata was dedicated to one, um, and I'm going to butcher this lady's last name, um, Julieta Guicciarde, and um, she was the Countess of Guicciarde, and later the Countess von Schillenberg. And um, she was still, you know, single when he dedicated this to her. And um, it later became known as the Moonlight Sonata uh, after Beethoven had already passed away by um, a music critic who, um, I'm going to get the quote a little wrong, but you'll get the gist of it. He described it, I wrote down the actual name of this um, sonata, and it is, let me find it, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. hang on. Oh, here it is. Okay. Wrong page. I have three pages of notes. I, uh, you know, I do an outline and then, you know, plot summary. Um, anyway. It was originally named um, the Piano Sonata Number no. 14 in C Sharp Minor, Opus 27, Number no. 2. Wow, that's a long name. I prefer Moonlight Sonata. It's one of um, my favorite works by Beethoven. It's very serene and sad, but the music critic compared it to being in a boat on the Lucerne, um, which is a lake in, in Switzerland, uh, in Moonlight. So that's where the Moonlight Sonata name came from. It, it became very popular after um, that music critic wrote, wrote that. Um, anyway, so it's the story is set mainly in Vienna, Austria. Um, there are several scenes in Baden, Germany um, at a, um, a, a resort kind of town where they... they take the waters from um, their thermal baths um, and in Naples, Italy. And then um, this is all between the years of 1799 to 1856 is when our story ends. Um, the main characters, of course, are Julieta, Julie, uh, Guicciarde, von Schillenberg, Ludwig van, Be van Beethoven, and I, I need to make a distinction here because you're about to hear some more Vons versus Van. Van means nothing. It's just of Beethoven. Von is a distinction reserved for Germanic nobility. So um, it notes that they own that area. So um, her cousin... Julie's cousin, since she is the, the main character of the story. Josephine von Brunswick, because she is from Brunswick. There is land called Brunswick in Austria. Um, later, von Daim. Uh, Friedrich von der Schulenberg. He's a Saxon noble who's a diplomat. Prince Karl Liknowski, who is a Russian prince. Um, and then Lucy Caldwell, who is Julie's maid. And 
she's not as big a character, but she is throughout the entire story by Julie's side. So she is kind of, um, she's there for everything. So loosely based on historical records, um, Beethoven never had a child. He adopted his uh, brother's son. His brother Carl had died. Um, he had another brother, Johann. Um, doesn't say anything about their children, though. Um, so, starting out in 1799 in Vienna. And Julie is invited to a small performance um, at her aunt uh, von Brunswick's request that her and her mother could attend um, a private performance from Beethoven. Well, they arrive at the salon, and Beethoven is there, but her aunts aren't. So, sorry, I'm going to get started on my makeup. Um, oh, I just lost an earring. Oops. Oh, well. Take the other one out. They arrive. Their, her aunts are late. Um, so... <clears throat> They're sitting there and they notice, you know, Beethoven is um, quite ugly, is the general consensus. Uh, he is dark skinned and he's got pockmarks. Never explains why. It doesn't list any major illnesses. So, not sure where the pop marks come from. They may be from um, acne as a teenager. Who knows? It doesn't tell you. And um, her aunts finally arrive. They're shocked, you know, that their niece and um, sister and sister-in-law, her mother, are on time. Because apparently that's, you know, not the social norm to be late fashionably late uh, anyway so Beethoven starts his if I said Mozart I like Mozart too totally different character though um, <clears throat> Beethoven starts his performance and I don't remember exactly what they um, said he performed but Julie was overwhelmed with the feelings that it evoked, and so she passes out. She'd never heard music like it, and <clears throat> as she's passing out, she calls Beethoven a werewolf, because um, apparently the hairstyle at the time for men was to be a little longer and kind of spiky, you know, and he had dark hair, dark skin, hairy hands, and um, so she passes out. When she wakes up, she find, she's in her um, cousin's bed. Mozart, why do I keep saying that? Beethoven had carried her up to her cousin's uh, bedroom since he was the only man in the house at the time, other than I presume servants, and I don't know if it just wasn't practical for the servants to carry her or if it's just, you know, a story thing. But, um, anyway. So he carries her up to her cousin's bedroom and he's concerned, of course, but also mostly amused that she called him a werewolf and that she passed out from listening to his music. So, that starts out our story. Well, she's fascinated by him. And he is a tutor to her cousin, Josephine, who is an aspiring musician. Um, she is noble as well. She is also a countess. Um, Josephine, of course, is madly in love with Beethoven. Beethoven is fond of her. Um, Julie and her maid arranged to have um, her maid accompanies her as a chaperone, I guess. 
um, they arranged to meet at Beethoven's apartments for piano forte lessons. Um, Julie does not have a new piano forte and the one that is in their apartment is um, it can't be tuned anymore. It's, it's you know, piece of crap. Broken. So, <clears throat> so they, um, they do this and he lives in constant chaos and mess. All he cares about, of course, is his music. And um, this is a prevailing th theme throughout the entire story. So, um, he says he can't instruct her properly with her maid, who, you know, is trying to um, subtly move stuff, you know, but the, the chaos is driving her insane. Um, she's distracting, so she has to leave for the hour for the uh, time that the lesson takes. And um, there's several of these kind of things with Julie becoming, basically falling in love with him. And remember, this is a romantic love lost kind of story. So you're not going to find a lot of sexual descriptions and stuff. It's very gently described. Um, so, she's falling in love with Beethoven. She doesn't know if he returns her feelings or not, but she thinks he does. And there's several of these scenes. Her sister, or her sister, she doesn't have any siblings. She's an only child. Um, her cousin Josephine has a marriage arranged to Count Von Diem. And, um, she doesn't want to marry him because, of course, she's in love with Beethoven. And, um, Beethoven does not return her feelings at the time. He is fond of her, but he is not in love with her. So, there's that. Um, she does marry the Count, and then she later falls in love with him. They have several children. He dies. You know, it's all... She's constant drama, much like Beethoven himself. Beethoven does fall in love with Julie over the course of their lessons and finds her very amusing and interesting. Um, they... I'm losing my train of thought. Sorry, let me refer to my notes here. Um, finding spell begins to tutor her. Uh, um... She discovers the depth of his feelings, and then a, a Prince Lykonowski, Lykonowski, I'm not sure, it's Russian, I'm not good with that, um, he holds a ball, and Beethoven is not much of a dancer, but the Prince is his major uh, benefactor. He gives him an annuity of... I believe it said 600 florins a year and supports him. So he um, he is attending the ball and he's, he doesn't dance as I said. Julie dances her first waltz which is um, a very scandalous dance at the time because of how close you have to be to one another during the, the dance. All other dances before then had, you know, been almost, a, you could put a person between the couple as they danced. So, you know, this was scandalous. Accepted scandalous, but still scandalous. Um, so, she dances it, her first dance, with a very handsome, she finds him very attractive, a handsome um, Saxon noble who's a diplomat in Vienna at the time. And his name, I mentioned it, um, Friedrich von der Schulenberg. <clears throat> and Beethoven witnesses this and gets extremely jealous. And um, he's a very snide, cynical man. He has um, no social graces whatsoever. He speaks his mind, and most of the time it's very loudly. Um, 
he refers to Friedrich through the rest of the book as um, Sir Walsenberg, as um, a reference to the waltz. Well, later, Judy, Judy, Julie goes to his apartments and um, you know, there's a big dramatic scene, of course, and um, Beethoven contesses, confesses to her that he is uh, slowly going deaf, and she's consoling him, and somehow, you know, they end up in bed. She loses her virginity to him, and then he later, the next day, um, says that he has to make amends for it, and that um, they should be married because, you know, he hadn't intended to rob her of her virginity. It wasn't gentlemanly, blah, 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 blah. And um, Julie's like, no, 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 it's it's fine. I was willing, you know, it was just as much her fault as his. There was no need to be proposing just because of that. And, you know, he confesses his love to her and, yeah. So they decide to wait on um, seeking her parents' permission for marriage until he returns because he is um, supposed to go on this trip. I don't remember exactly where. He goes on many of these trips. Um, some of them musically inclined and others for um, treatments for his deafness. But they decide to wait until he gets back from his trip to seek her parents' permission. Well, while she's visiting her cousin Josephine, who has recently given birth and is, um, you know, she's going through uh, postpartum depression. So, she's visiting her cousin and um, noticing, you know, how fond she is of children for the first time. Um, and blood starts to gush. And um, she basically, she loses the baby. She has a miscarriage while she's there. Her parents are out of town also. So, you know, this comes at a good time. They're visiting her father's relatives, I think, in Reggio. Um, so, her cousin and her, her, bleh, her cousin's husband take care of her and nurse her back to health. And, um agree to keep her secret. So, we've got that. Um, her parents return. They know nothing. Beethoven returns, and um, she meets him at his apartment, and she doesn't even have to say a word. He can see her face, and he figures it out. He's like, oh, she's lost the baby. She tells him yes, and he goes into a deep, dark depression because he was so excited that they were going to have a baby. Um, that That's when he composes the Moonlight Sonata. So, um, and they carry on with their secret love affair for many years. <clears throat> and his... He comes and goes. Her mom's trying to get her to marry. Um, she is considered a great beauty at the time, um, you know. But they're they're not extremely wealthy, um, even though they are part of the nobility. And so, her mother wants her to marry very well. Um, cause she doesn't have much of a dowry, so, but she's, like I said, she's a, a great beauty. Her mother is considered, um, one of the most beautiful women in the world at this time. Um, so, <clears throat> off and on, you know, they're in love, Julie's able to, you know, postpone any marriage attempts. Um, her mother really wants her to marry, um, Count von Gollenberg, Robert, who is an aspiring musician as well, 
Um, he's mediocre at best, is how the novel describes him. Um, so, sorry, I need a brush. Um, <clears throat> so, where was I? Um, Beethoven's hearing is uh, slowly getting worse. And he comes to her one day and just says how much he loves the sound of her voice. It's, it's rapturous. And he wants to marry her before he can, before he completely loses his hearing and can no longer hear her voice. He wants to be able to hear her recite their vows. Um, so she says yes. She goes to her father. Her mom is out of town at a spa in Baden taking the waters and he agrees he asks her you know are you sure this is what you want it won't be an easy life being married to a musician um and she's you know totally oh yes yes this is what i want you know i love him blah 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 you know all that stuff and um so he agrees and he says well let's not make it public until your mother gets back because she'd be very upset if we announce this without her knowing first and Julie agrees because her mother is an extremely vain, selfish aristocrat. And um, she's not happy in her marriage, by the way. So, I need another mirror. This one's just not going to work. Um, so they wait till she gets back. She returns and she is positively outraged. There's no way her daughter is going to marry a penniless musician. Um, she doesn't even like Beethoven's music compositions. She prefers Mozart, who, by the way, lived before Beethoven. Um, so, she's having a fit from hell. Says no. Julie's determined she's going to marry her man. And... Her mother goes to her lover, who happens to be Prince Lichnowsky, who is his, uh, Beethoven's major supporter and benefactor. Remember 600 florins? Yeah. So he threatens Julie to make his affair with her mother public and to cut off Beethoven's annuity completely if she does not marry um, von Gallenberg. So she marries him. She gives in. She can't have bring shame to her father that way because her father is completely oblivious. He lives in his library, loves his books. So she marries Count Gallenberg. She breaks it off with Beethoven. She tells him she didn't love him, that she was only doing this to um, make Gallenberg jealous. So, he is heartbroken, and Julie, on her wedding night, finds out that Gollenberg is a closet homosexual, because um, at that time in Austria, you could be executed for being homosexual. So, he suggests that she has a substitute to perform um, sexually in his place. Um, and that if she wanted to take a lover, if she was discreet about it, it was no big deal. And he doesn't actually say that he's a homosexual at this time. He just says that he's unable to and that um, he's tried everything and nothing works. So he leaves the room and Prince Lachnowski comes in to be his substitute for her wedding night. And um, he is known as a debauched uh, pervert, basically. And um, she is completely repulsed by him, A, because of his reputation, and B, because he is his, her mother's lover. And um, he is... 
totally turned on by all this rejection, <clears throat> and proceeds to rape her. Well, they leave for Naples because Lychnowski has arranged for Gollenberg, who they did not know that um, was actually just as poor as Julie's family. They just put on a, a better show, um, but almost destitute. So, Lychnowski has gotten Gollenberg a um, position at a bank in Naples. So they moved to Naples. Um, she discovers she's pregnant with the prince's child. Um, she's very upset and sad about it. Um, she, sorry, just getting my stuff out of the way. Um, very sad through the whole pregnancy. Can't tell anybody about it because it's shameful that she was raped. Um, and then she loses, well, she doesn't lose the baby. She starts having, um, horrible pains and her maid takes her to the hospital and, um, they can't find a heartbeat. So the doctor is convinced that the baby has died, which it has. So she has, um, she has to stay there until she delivers and she is more upset about that that she has to stay in the hospital and not go home, then she is about the baby being dead. Because, you know, it was the product of a rape. And <clears throat> so she delivers a stillborn son, and her husband, Robert, of course, is, is upset because that was going to be his heir. And he suggests, you know, that she consider taking a lover so he can have an heir. It's important to him. And then she, um, one day, comes home, was supposed to be doing something else at the time, but um, didn't pan out. So she comes home earlier than her husband had expected her to and hears noises. So she goes to his bedroom and lo and behold, there he is with another man. No problems whatsoever. So that's when she discovers he is actually just homosexual and not attracted to her, and that it's not an actual medical problem that he cannot perform. So, that's when she starts slowly coming to the idea that maybe taking a lover is okay. Um, trying to decide if I want eyeliner or not. I think I do. So, Julie is, um, you know, contemplating all this. The man that she had been admiring from her window in Naples, um, a fisherman that she fished outside a window of her apartment, um, she thought was extremely attractive, and that turns out to be uh, the man that her husband takes as a lover. So, yeah, great disappointment there. She, um... She goes with her mother to take the waters in Baden. And while she's there, she runs into von der Schulenberg, his wife, Armgard. Don't ask me. Armgard. Um, and she is taking the waters as well as a possible treatment for her infertility. And... She proposes that um, since they were both seeking a baby, <clears throat> that, she, that Julie sleeps with her husband, Friedrich. Well, Julie at first is a little outraged at this, not offended, just a little off-put. And um, then she decides, what the heck, you know, a child would be pleasant to have. Um, Friedrich is handsome. He's blonde and blue-eyed like her mother. So she agrees. Friedrich and her, of course, you know, they get it on. Um, she goes home. She tells her husband who she slept with and that she's pregnant. 
and he's thrilled because von der Schulenberg is um, a good name. So he's thrilled to death that you know that they'll have a he'll have an heir, and not a child by someone you know common. So that makes him happy. She delivers a healthy boy. Um, her and Friedrich meet up several times. She goes back to Vienna a few times. Um, she runs into Beethoven at Baden in Vienna. Um, Beethoven never goes to Naples, though. Uh, Friedrich does. He, he and Armgard come to uh, see his child, because it's all just, you know, kind of a an arrangement. Friedrich won't be involved in their lives, that Robert will be their actual father, but he knows he has children, even if they don't have his name. Well... Her and Friedrich meet up a few more times. Um, they have another tryst, and she becomes pregnant. She delivers a daughter. Um, like I said, you know, a lot of this is going on. There's Napoleon is all over the place in this book um, and his relatives. So there's political intrigues going on that um, she ends up involved in. Um, and then her and Friedrich meet up for a third time, and she becomes pregnant again and has another son by him. And uh, she and the children go back to Vienna, and um, Armgard and Friedrich. I'm not, I can't remember the exact setting it was, but um, Armgard notices that Julie has three children and they all look like her husband's. And she becomes really pissed because the arrangement was for only one child. So she feels like they've betrayed her. And she gets super jealous of Julie. And, you know, over the course of all this, Julie and Friedrich have entertained the thought of leaving their spouses. Um, they do feel love for one another, but they don't, they don't leave their spouses. They stay. So, that goes nowhere. Um, I've lost my place again. Arm guard has found out about the children. Um, let's see... I'm getting close to the basically the conclusion you know there's a whole lot of stuff back and forth um, the Vienna Congress happens after Bonaparte has um, declared himself emperor and you know tries to basically take over the world like Alexander the Great and it doesn't work so he's exiled and then that's when the Vienna Congress happens and Julie is there on Bonaparte's sister's behalf spying very badly I might add um her and Friedrich meet up her and Beethoven meet up you know there's just a whole lot of back and forth back and forth and the one question that plagues Julie throughout this entire thing with Beethoven is if she had told him that she was being blackmailed, would he choose her or would he choose the money from Prince Lykonowski? And it has always bothered her. Well, towards the end of the story, you know, all this is taking place over several chapters. Um, Beethoven is almost completely deaf at this time, and he's um, caught a, a really bad cold, he thinks. 
His eyes are yellow. His skin is yellow. He, he was a heavy drinker and his liver is cirrhosed. They, that's a medical fact. They did perform an autopsy on him. Um, he's miserable in pain constantly. You know, Julie is back in Vienna, um, separated from her husband, but not divorced. I don't think they ever divorce. I think they just lived separate lives. It was I'm I'm sure a lot of arranged marriages were like that though. I'm sure it was probably very lucky if you actually fell in love or even had affection for whoever your parents picked out for you to marry. So um she's visiting with Beethoven and she asks, you know, while he's on his sick bed, she tells him what happened because Lichnowski is no longer supporting Beethoven and has cast aside her mother for a younger version. Um, so he has no hold. So she asks Beethoven, what would you have done? And he replies, the money. And she knows in her soul that she knew that all along, but she didn't want to admit that and, and ruin her image. I guess, of um, Beethoven and his love, their love, their great passionate love affair. Um, so, you know, that kind of ends the story. They describe Beethoven's funeral. Um, they... Um, How does it? That kind of closes that chapter, and then it picks up with an epilogue, which is 20 years later with Julie. And basically, you know, everyone has um, passed away. She's in her 70s. Um, it's 18, whatever I said the, the last date was 56, 36. Let me see. Uh, 56. And, you know, she's not at her deathbed, but she's definitely older and not able to travel as much as she would like. And just kind of reflective. She's finally at peace with how her life turned out. Um, you know, just kind of summarizes the woman in the moonlight that created this... Um, fantastically famous sonata and um, it just kind of closes the book up it you know wraps everything up nice and neat what happened to, to whom um, who was still living and what they were doing you know that kind of stuff and uh, it just you know closes the book very nicely um, okay my thoughts <clears throat> Still doing my makeup while I'm doing my final thoughts, too. Um, I liked the book. I know this is something that I will probably never read again. Um, it was beautifully written, but it's very slow-moving. Um, you know, the intrigues are more... slower paced than I guess I would actually prefer. Um, I'm just, yeah, it was, it was a good book. It was very well written. Um, there was sweet moments. You know, I cried a couple of times, mainly when her parents died because, um, it was just such a moving scene. I've lost my dad. You know, that kind of, it. you know, it hit me. Um, so, like I said, it's a good book. It's, um, there's almost no typos. Well, actually, I don't think I noticed a single typo. Um, I had to look up several words because I like music. I don't play any instruments. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. 
I'm just, yeah, I'm just really bad. Um, and I was left vaguely dissatisfied with the story. I mean, I knew it was about Julie, but I was still left wanting more, I guess. I mean, I don't regret reading it. Um, I don't know. I don't feel like it was a waste of time. I just wish the story had oh, more zing, I guess. I like thrillers. And this was definitely not a thriller. It was slower paced and I just, I guess I just wasn't in the mood, you know? I wanted something, like I said, more. And, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, um, like I said, I'll, I'll know I'll never read this book again. And that's okay, you know? I don't have to read every book that I like. I don't have to love it and want to reread it. You know, it was fascinating. I learned a lot about um, music composition through it. Um, I don't think there's any way in hell I would ever be able to compose a song. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and it asks, you know, some fascinating questions, you know, like how does Mozart know when the song is finished? You know, how do you know the story is complete? And, um, like I said, it's nothing that I regret reading. It's just, you know, I guess I was more in the mood for something, um, more action, maybe scary. I don't know. You know, it's just, it's just my mood right now in the fall. Um, let me put this on and then I'll tell you what's coming up next. read a single word of it yet, but I have opened it and downloaded it um, in my October 1st um, Kindle Reads, where you get a free book every month. This month I could have gotten two, but there was only one that kind of interested me, and it's The Spellbreaker. Um, it's written by, I don't remember the author off the top of my head, sorry, but they wrote The Paper Magician, which I read years ago when it first came out, and um, I remember really liking it. Can't tell you a single thing about it, but you know, I liked it at the time. So I'm hoping this one's equally good. Um, it's a fantasy and um, about magic. So next week we'll talk about that one. And uh, let me know what you think down below. Um, like I said, this was more of a sleepy, sweet romance, um, and it had a lot of big names from history in it, but, you know, like I said, it just wasn't a, a thriller by any means, which is my preferred, um, type of book to read. So, you know, I feel, I have mixed feelings on it. I'm not, like I said, I'm not upset that I wasted time or anything, you know, it was a, it was a good book. It just, um, it probably would have been better in the winter time when I was in more of a, um, cozy book kind of mood, because that's definitely what this is. Um, so if it's your cup of tea, let me know if you read it and what you think. Um, it is available on Kindle and, um, most of the books that I probably will review in the future are probably available on Kindle. Um, any questions, comments, leave them below if you don't mind. Give me a like. Subscribe if you haven't. And go check me out on Instagram. Um, I post all kinds of 
oddball things on there. So it's not always related to my YouTube. Although I do like to direct, you know, Instagram to YouTube and YouTube to Instagram. Um, just because, you know, there's different content on both. Uh, I hope you all have a great day. And I hope you enjoyed this very rambling review of a sleepy book. And um, I hope you have a great day. Bye. And thanks for watching.